All right, welcome back, friends. Time to take a look at some more advanced FBX techniques beyond just importing and instancing. Today, we're going to talk about getting our hands dirty and editing some geometry. This is something that comes up a lot, especially when you get further along on a project and you have some things already in place and you realize, you know what? Something about this just isn't looking right. I need to change this detail or I need to swap out this object for another one. There are a number of scenarios when you just want to be able to make changes to something in place. Well, good news. Houdini offers several methods of geo trickery that I would say are extremely difficult to do in other packages, if not impossible. So let's check it out. Let's take a look at how we can seamlessly start editing and manipulating some stuff. First things first, we need to accept this golden rule. When editing geometry, external or otherwise, always, always, always edit your geo at the origin or as close to the origin as you can. You really want to avoid editing something that's like 100 units on the X, 21 on the Y, and like 3.14132 units on the Z or whatever. So just drill this rule into your head, stick with it whenever possible. Why? Well, it's just gonna make your life a lot easier and it's gonna make Houdini's life a lot easier too. Now, why is this, you might ask? Well, let's take a look at a couple things here. First, every node you make is going to come in at the origin, which makes that their domain or their transform space by default. For instance, let's make a cube and we'll just move it somewhere in space. Now drop a transform and of course it is at the origin. So right off the bat, if we start adjusting values, everything is tied to the origin. Now you can offset the origin of the transform node. If you go into this pivot translate section here, you can use some H script $CEX, $CEY, and $CEZ. We'll move it to the center of the bounding box of the geo that it's connected to. That's very helpful. But of course, if your cube has any rotations or, or anything applied to it, then your axes are gonna be misaligned and so your values won't be predictable. Not to mention the fact that you have to do some version of this recentering to every single node that you drop down now. It's annoying, it's a waste of time. So what you actually wanna be doing is kind of the opposite of this approach. First, you wanna move your geo back to the center from wherever it is, then apply your edits, and then re-transform it back to its original position. We kind of got started on this in the last video using the match size node, which we effectively pulled a bunch of objects back to the origin so that we could use them more effectively. This is called an inverse transform. Although in that case, it's not a full transform, position, scale, and rotation. It's actually just the position. So it's more of an inverse translate. Nevertheless, this is very useful and a lot of times it's all you'll need. But let's take a little gander, shall we, at some of the other features in the match size node that we can use to take this concept a little further. Here we have this FBX, again from Sketchfab, link in description, and it's a nice little modern country villa or whatever. We can see that this model is coming in not at the origin, so you may need to just grab the whole thing and move it if you want to blow it up or something crazy like that. In this case, though, it's fine. Maybe I actually want it to be positioned here because maybe I've built a whole scene around it and I've already got the camera set up and all that. It's great. It's perfect. There's just one little problem. And that problem is this little piece of wall. I want some more sunlight in my modern industrial minimalist country home and therefore this wall needs a window. So let's isolate this wall first. We'll use the viewport tools for this and this is such a helpful little feature here. People always talk shit about Houdini's viewport tools but some of them are really great. Press S for the selection tool and in primitive mode, open up this little select dropdown and pick name attribute. Now we're selecting primitives that share the same name, which is perfect for FBX. So grab the wall and then hit delete. What that's going to do is create a blast stop and we just need to go in and invert that so it deletes everything except this wall piece. Now let's just copy that selection value and we'll replace the blast stop with a split. In our selection, we'll paste that name value in and there we go, we have our little wall section isolated. If you want to narrow down this section even more, you can just blast away any bits you don't want. You would do that here in the node network. I'm fine with this though. So let's just use our match size to bring it to the center. Sweet. This wall is also a bit big for modeling. I'd rather work at a smaller scale. So let's connect the second input to a box here. We can make this box any size and we'll check scale to fit and we'll leave it on best fit. This is going to scale it uniformly to roughly match the bounding box of the reference geometry in the second input. Finally, if we scroll down in the match size SOP, we see two checkboxes, stash transform and restore transform. Let's tick stash transform. Now we'll make a quick window here. We'll just drop down a cube, position that, and run both of these into a Boolean. Wow, look at this beautiful window. 
And I'm really gonna push the minimalist aesthetic on this one. I'm not even gonna add any glass. Just a hole in the wall so now we can be one with nature or something. It's conceptual. Okay, that's done. So how do we get it back to where it belongs? Well, it's as simple as dropping down another match size, except on this one, we'll scroll down and we'll tick the other checks box, restore transform. And would you look at that? It's moved. Let's merge this together with the other output from the split node. And we can see that magically our new wall is exactly where it should be. And it's back to its regular scale. How cool is that? Okay, so what's happening here? Well, if we look at the geo spreadsheet, we can see that our first match size is creating this X form attribute and stashing all the values it applies into that attribute. The values look funny and we'll talk about that in one second. Then our second match size just looks for that attribute and applies the inverse of those values. Inverse transform, get it? We can change the name of the attribute as well. You just have to make sure it matches on both nodes. This can be handy if you need to stash multiple transforms for different objects at the same time, i.e. xform1, xform2, etc. Okay, so now we've got translation and we've got scale, but what if our object has some rotation on it that we need to correct for? This third example has exactly this issue. Here we have a little mind setup looking all stylized and cute. I want to replace this cart here with something different. Maybe, oh, I don't know, Craig? Now, obviously we could just delete the cart and drop Craig in there and move him to the correct position by hand like a pleb, but that would be A, boring, B, slow, and C, not procedural. So if we drop down a match size, we can see the problem. We can move it and scale it, but we can't rotate it. We're gonna need to pull out the big guns on this one, and don't worry if this is over your head right now. I just want you to understand the basic concept of what's happening, just to get the gears turning in ye old brain for now. Let's isolate the cart here and we'll find the name same way as before. Vagen low poly dot one Ah, Wagen. Perhaps this is dein Deutsche Wagen? Wunderbar. Swap that out for a split again and let's take a look at the spreadsheet now, this time in the points. Now, remember in the last video we talked about these default FBX attributes, the position, the rotation, and the scale? Well, it just so happens we can actually use this info to reverse engineer the transformations that have been applied to this object in whichever software it was made. A brief aside, these basic transform controls we access everywhere, position, scale, rotation, this is all just a friendly interface for us lowly humans to use. Behind the scenes, Houdini, and actually all 3D software, are taking the values here and converting them into something called a transformation matrix. Now matrices are well outside of the scope of this series, and if I'm being honest, I'll say I don't even fully understand them myself. Luckily in Houdini, you don't need to understand how matrices work so much as you just need to understand what they do and the various ways in which to use them. If that sounds uncomfortable, well, think about how many things in your life you use that you have no idea how they work. Your computer, your phone, heck, even your fridge. You don't need to understand the math and engineering behind them, you just need to know what they do and how to use them. But if you wanna be a bookworm and learn more about matrices, I will drop some links in the description below. But again, do not sweat it if it doesn't click immediately. These things are definitely not intuitive. These are advanced concepts and it's gonna take a while for it all to sink in. So in Houdini, we can interface with matrices in a number of ways. I like using VEX personally, but you can also make this work in VOPS. Basically with all these default FBX attributes, we have all the ingredients we need to make our own home rolled matrix. We just need to combine them in order for Houdini to be able to make sense of the data. So we'll need to use this little function here appropriately titled make transform. We can see in the description here that this function builds a general four x four transform matrix given an order of transformations, TRS, an order for rotations, XYZ, a vector for the translation, rotation, and scale. It also says below that this function expects degrees and not radians. Fun fact, in addition to the aforementioned transformation interface we use, there is one additional layer of complexity, because of course there is. It turns out that degrees aren't actually the most efficient way to handle rotations in 3D space, but they are the most widely understood and human readable, which is why the interface uses them. But behind the scenes, these values are actually being converted to another unit of rotation called a radian. Radians operate on a whole different basis tied to the idea of a radius and the magical number we call pi. Again, you don't really need to know how they work, you just need to know that they're there. And if you do want to know more, well, I don't know, Google it. Okay, so the first bit of description there is slightly confusing, but let's start by making the vectors for T, R, and S, as that's pretty straightforward. All we need to do is pull in these FBX attributes, and just for clarity, we'll rename them to T, R, and S. You don't need to do this to make it work. 
What we do need to do, however, is convert the R vector into degrees, as the FBX default is going to be in radians. So I'll just grab that value and wrap it in this handy degrees function. Done. Now let's plug it into the function. Type matrix M equals make transform X form underscore RTS X form underscore XYZ T R S semicolon. These first two values here are constants. That's why they're in all caps. That's just a programming convention. And what they're doing is instructing Houdini as to what order to apply the transformations. So in this case, RTS, we're applying the rotation, then the translation, and finally the scale. This, as far as I can tell, all depends on the way that the FBX is encoded when it's output. So you might just need to mess around with a couple different combinations to get it right. Same goes for the next value, x form xyz, which is telling Houdini the order of the rotation. In this case, it will rotate the objects on the x-axis, followed by the y and the z. And if you're wondering how the heck I knew how to use these x form constants in the first place, well, they are listed right here in the manual. Got to make sure you read this thing carefully. Alrighty, matrix built. Now we need to actually apply it. The interesting thing about matrices is that the way you apply them is on a point by point basis. You can think of it as applying the same offset to each point. Therefore, they maintain the relationships to one another. So we need to just take the at P and multiply it by our matrix. This is actually going to push it further from the origin because as I said before, we need the inverse transform. Luckily, Houdini has this very handy invert function. Bada bing. Now in this case, the cart is rotated by 90 degrees on the X. I assume because this was made using a software with a Z up standard, probably Blender. So we need to manually rotate that so it makes sense in Houdini. It is what it is. Okay, that's awesome. We have our matrix set up and we know it's working because our object is at the origin and unrotated. So how can we apply it to some other geometry to replace this card? Well, as I just said, all we're doing is applying the same offset to every point. And if we create a matrix attribute here, in VEX four means four by four matrix when you're assigning an attribute. And if we look at that in the spreadsheet, we can see that it's just the same value on every point. For single value attributes, the easiest and most efficient way to move them around is to promote them to a detail attribute. Otherwise, all these extra numbers are just taking up memory unnecessarily. So let's do an attribute promote from point to detail in a separate chain here. Meanwhile, we'll drop down old Craggy. We'll unpack him because otherwise we're going to get weird results. Drop a point wrangle and wire in our new detail level matrix attribute to the second input. Now we just need to multiply each of Craig's points by that value. So we'll pull it into a variable here again, just called M M equals detail one mat zero. And then like before, we'll just multiply it by at P. And would you look at that? Craig has moved to the exact position and rotation of the cart. Now we do need to rotate him by 90 degrees before the transform to account for that axis issue. And now it's perfect. How cool is that? Now, if we want to do any edits, we can do it at the origin. Craig's animation also respects his new transform space, so you get a consistent result wherever he is. Get him, Craig. All right, y'all. Going to wrap this one up here before we get too carried away. Go forth and become one with the matrix. And if you get stuck, just remember, there is no spoon. In the next video, we'll take a look at importing Alembic files and some of the ways we can have fun with those. Toodaloo!